okay, well, we'll just go ahead and jump into uh, Photoshop. So uh, where we left off last week was uh, exactly right here. Um, there was one thing that I wanted to point out to you um, about my setup in Photoshop. Um, if you're following along with the videos sort of rigorously, um, you may notice that my, uh, when I first uh, assigned the Essentials workspace, my palettes didn't look exactly like this. Um, this is the default Essentials workspace that you all would get. So um, I just changed my workspace to the default. Um, and in general, if you have a workspace selected, like the Essentials workspace is what we're going to be using in this class, and things look weird or things have kind of migrated because maybe you've moved stuff around or whatever, all you have to do to reset it is click Reset Essentials, and then it will go back to sort of the default. Um, so I'm using the default because I think it's helpful for you all to sort of be you know, as synchronized as possible, um, to have your experience be as close to mine. Um, certainly, if there are things that you like to do, like this, um, Go for it. Um, that doesn't matter. But I'm uh, particularly for people who probably have, um, you know, no exposure to Photoshop. Um, it might be useful to kind of keep that essentials configuration. Um, that being said, I think I'm going to go ahead and move this back. <laughs> so, um, so I did want to just mention that briefly. Um, also, uh, I'm just going to kind of go over the sort of layers that we have in the file. So I'm going to uh, make the layers invisible by cl clicking this eye. And uh, someone asked me a really good question after class on Thursday, and that was, do we need a background? Um, and my answer to that is, mm, what's a background? Um, that's sort of maybe a flippant way of saying, not really. <laughs> um, you don't. Um, so with this, um, I actually, uh, prop let me go back just a couple of steps. Um, I can't undo it, but this had been the background, and if you right-click it, um, you can click on the lock, and it will unlock the background and convert it into layer zero. Um, and so basically just click the lock, it becomes a regular layer just like everything else. Um, I had already done that to show the student that asked. Um, so what happens if we get rid of the background? Well, we, um, we land on the sort of Photoshop ease um, symbol for transparency. So right now, um, it means that there, if we were to save this as like a JPEG, for example, our image would be white if it were a JPEG. If we saved it as a PNG, it would actually be completely transparent. It would probably appear as white. Um, so. Whether you choose to have a transparent background, um, as you can see now I can you know, impose this image over that, that's completely up to you. It's really an aesthetic decision. Um, if you're putting things on, let's say maybe a website and you want things to kind of like float on top of each other in a really slick way, ooh, transparent backgrounds are awesome for that. Um, if you're making a print project like we're doing, a transparent background is kind of pointless because it's just going to be white. Um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and just um, reactivate layer zero and kind of work with a white background. The other reason why you may want a background we'll get into later um, in the class today, and that is that some uh, blending techniques in Photoshop take into account the color of what is underneath. So it could be black, it could be white, um, and that can kind of affect the way your layers might blend. So one of the cool things about Photoshop, and especially with working in layers, is that you can just take one layer and completely change it. And it will completely change your composition if you're using blending and some of the other techniques that we're going to talk about today. So don't be afraid to kind of change this, change the color of it, mix it up. You could even paste an image onto it or whatever. Um, we could scale this up and have this be our background if we wanted to. Um, let's just go ahead and maybe do that just so we can kind of get the experience of doing it. So this is sort of a little bit of a review of last week. So I'm going to click on this layer. Um, and of course, you do have to click on the layer in order to do stuff to it. If I 
click on this layer and then try to do stuff to this layer. Look, let me get the move tool. Oh, nothing happens. It confuses me. I'm gonna write myself an email and ask myself why that happened. Um, it, it happened because I'm on the wrong layer. So you do have to make sure that the layer is selected. That's like a really common mistake and I, I, I still make it myself. So let's go ahead and as we have the move tool selected, I'm gonna click this box called show transform controls. That's gonna bring up that bounding box that we saw. And I can go ahead and scale this up. Now we did spend quite a bit of time in the last couple of classes thinking about when you should or shouldn't scale an image. And as you can see, I'm definitely scaling this image. Um, is it bad, is it good? It's kind of a blurry, kind of not very sharp image anyway, so I don't think that it's going to be a problem. The other reason why I'm sort of saying that maybe it's okay to scale this image is that you may not know this yet, but this image is gonna be in the back of everything else. So it's just not gonna be a super prominent part of our composition. So, um, and the other reason why I think it's okay to scale this image is because I didn't scale it that much. I scaled it like maybe 15, 20%. So I have to click the checkbox as we, uh, as we learned on Thursday. And then I have this fully transformed image. Um, also, a quick note about the transform controls. You may have noticed that I was sort of scaling it to really fit the window, so I actually warped it a little bit, meaning that I scaled it like th that. Um, if you take the uh, uh, end of this and you hit the shift key, it will um, make it so that you can scale it in a non-uniform way. I mean, this can be kind of a cool effect, depending on what you have. Um, Usually, I wouldn't necessarily scale that way if you have text, um, because it tends to make text unreadable. But um, yeah, it's just another way that you can do it. So in general, the Shift, the Option, and the Alt key um, will do things to pretty much all the tools in Photoshop. So they'll um, basically like activate variations um, on those tools. So now we've got this thing in the, in the so-called background position. Um, and if I put this other layer on top, um, and then we also have the sort of layer that we rasterized. I think um, to move forward with this composition, I'd really like to just get some more uh, information and more layers in, into this project. So I think I'm gonna open up this mm, horseshoe image. Um, and I'm going to open it with this. And um, I think what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to um, select the horseshoe. Now, this doesn't seem terribly challenging because there's a super clear separation between the background and the, uh, the object. Um, let's just take a look and see. So I'm gonna use the magic wand tool Interesting. Ah, okay, so this is a good, good sort of like what <laughs> moment. Um, I think that the last time I used the magic wand tool, I put it in subtractive mode. So uh, when you put it in subtractive mode, it stays there. And as you can see right now, I don't have anything selected. So Photoshop is like, what am I supposed to subtract from? There's nothing there. So I'm just gonna put it back into normal mode and then hopefully that will activate the uh, issue. Okay, there's one other issue and um, it's kind of funny, see this, um, I wonder how that happened. Um, the, so the settings, this is good for you to know. When you're using the magic wand tool, the, the default setting is 32. That's the, that's the default tolerance level of the magic wand tool. So if I hit this with a 32, oh good, I'm not going losing my mind, um, then you can see it's pretty aggressive and it gets a lot of pixels. Um, you may have noticed that for some reason my value had, uh, tolerance value had gotten switched to one, which basically um, just 
it doesn't really give it permission to s select contiguous pixels. So why would you want a high or a low tolerance? Well, for something like this, I would probably use a high tolerance because there's a super clear distinction between background and foreground. So if I click this, it's gonna you know, add a bunch of stuff to my selection. I can hit the shift key and add things to the selection. And this is a pretty good um, case for just using the magic wand tool sort of straight up. Now, there's a couple of things that we're gonna have to do here that kind of complicate matters. So I'm just hitting the shift key and just clicking to kind of add these smaller areas. Do I want to go ahead and maybe add these areas, these little holes? Um, I guess I could. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey. So um, you can see that my tolerance now is 32. I'm gonna um, see this sort of brown uh, shadow from the, the hole. That, um, that is pretty close to the color of the actual horseshoe itself. Right? So, so because the tolerance is set so high, it's, it's set to um, select a, a wide range of colors. If I lower the tolerance to let's say like 15 and then I select it, you can see it's being much less aggressive. Um, it's just, whoa, there. Um, and definitely, you kind of have to go in a little bit carefully. So I'm going to go ahead and just grab these because we can. Um, you'll notice because the tolerance is set low, it's sort of not maybe detecting some of these little tiny details like the hair and things like that. Um, and then I'll go ahead and select this one. And then I think we're probably ready to go. Well, I guess if I did those, I should probably do these. So uh, y'all are being very polite. Nobody has asked me about that piece of candy in the middle and how we're going to deal with it. Um, so that's the next thing we're going to talk about. Um, and there's a couple of things that we can do. One thing is we uh, can try a, a different mode of selection, which is called the quick mask mode. Um, I'm being not super, super careful just because um, we're a little, you know, always pressured for time. So if I can't get every little piece of those holes, I'm not going to be super sad. So what are we going to do with this piece of candy in the middle? Well, um, I could go back into the, probably the most straightforward thing would be to go back into subtractive mode and uh, whoops. And then um, I could use the magic wand tool, but that seems like a lot of clicking. Um, I'm going to actually use the uh, ellipse tool. Well, hang on. So if we do the magic wand tool, let me just explore that and then I'll show you the other method. So if we do the magic wand tool, as you can see, it's just kind of a lot of clicking. Um, I basically have to just get rid of all this stuff. And it's annoying and so on and so forth. So the, the technique that I think is really the best, and here we'll use the marquee tools, is something called quick mask. So Quick Mask is actually a mode that you flip in Photoshop, and it's used specifically for making detailed selections. So it's down here under the foreground and background color. And if you click it, um, you can see, wow, that's different. Um, it's, it basically kind of paints uh, with red anything that's selected, and then anything that's not selected is not red. So why is this a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because you can use a paintbrush tool, for example. So right now, I have my paintbrush set super small. I'll just go ahead and change that a little. 
Um, if you don't know what size paintbrush you want to use, you can just preview the cursor in the screen by moving it over. Um, I want to use a big paintbrush because I want to do less work, which sounds good. So I'm going to make it really big. Um, and basically, you can add areas to the selection. So let me go ahead and add a bunch of stuff. And I'm going to just toggle out of Quick Mask. And you can see now my selection has been updated. So that is not actually what we wanted to do. We wanted to do just the opposite, which was to get rid of this thing. So you can also use the eraser tool um, in a very similar way with a large brush. And right now it looks like our brush is fuzzy. Um, so one thing I will tell you about making selections is that it's actually really a good idea to have a hard brush, 100% uh, hard, because you can always feather the selection with the selection modification methods. Um, but if you use a fuzzy brush, you can't like sharpen it up. Um, and especially with selections, if you use fuzzy brushes for selections, it tends to make things look like they have halos or that they're glowing. Um, to be fair, you can totally use it for artistic effect, but if you're looking for a clean uh, selection, probably don't use fuzzy brushes. So with a hard brush, you can see it's like, oh, it is definitely gone. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I'm just going to undo that. Another technique you can use within Quick Mask is to use the, any of the marquee tools for a really quick selection. And then you can just um, delete, basically fill it with white, which is deleting in Quick Mask. So yeah, Quick Mask is super useful, and I use it pretty much all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and deselect, um, and I'm also going to clean up that little thing on the side with my fuzzy brush. Excuse me. I would want the eraser for that. Um, and anyway, so now we have this selection that's pretty, pretty decent. Um, it's pretty close to like what we want. Do we have to have our selection absolutely 100% perfect at this time? Not, not really. Um, we're going to make a layer mask uh, like we did um, on Thursday. And as I will also kind of maybe just review for you today, with layer masks, you can change them at any time. So, so don't stress out about, about getting your selection just perfect. Um, let's go ahead and create a layer mask. So in this case, it looks like the background is selected. And the, because you can see the background is selected because it has the marching ants on the, on the exterior. So I think probably if we wanted to knock this out from the background, we would want to hide the selection in this case. So let's hide the selection. And now you can see we have this beautiful layer mask. So making uh, a layer mask is just like one click more work. And it's super awesome. Because if you were to maybe say just delete all of those selected pixels, then what happens? You are stuck. <laughs> You're stuck with that forever. Pretty much. Um, I guess you could use the history palette maybe to go back a few steps, but you'd still have to go through the process of doing that. So with layer masks, you can actually select the layer mask, and you can use the paintbrush to add um, areas back in. And this can actually just be a really cool artistic technique. Um, and then you can also use the eraser to then get rid of those pixels. So I'm going to control Z that, because I don't want to have to redo the selection. But yeah, that's basically what is so cool about layer masks. Now, you may notice that over here in layer 0, I have the layer mask selected. It's got a little box around it. If I want to do all sorts of important things, like maybe move this, well, we can move it. But in general, if you're just doing general work in Photoshop, it's always better to um, sort of select the image itself. 
Um, if you select the layer mask and you try to uh, do certain Photoshop things, it basically will just not do it. <laughs> and you'll, and it, it's kind of confusing when that happens. So, so if you're not actively editing the layer mask, try to keep the, um, the actual image layer selected. So now I'm going to go ahead and just click and drag this into our collage. Da -da. Um, you can see it's scaled a little bit differently than the collage. That's no problem. Um, I think actually I want to scale this down quite a bit. And again, if you hit the shift key, you can go non-uniform. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I kind of want it to look like a horseshoe. Um, so there it is scaled down quite a bit. Um, you can see that it came in as a uh, layer two. And uh, what if we don't like the name layer two? Um, one thing that I've noticed over the years when I'm working in Photoshop with, especially with complex files with lots of layers, um, it can be really, really helpful to actually name the layer. So uh, you can just uh, basically click uh, and hold, and then you can rename the layer. Um, if you make the layer a little name, a little bit descriptive, it can help you find things in, in kind of the mess of your Photoshop file. Um, so that's something you can do. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit. It seems like we've got this horseshoe. And one of the things that I wanted to show you was how to make layer groups. So that's a really key technique. So in order to do it, I'm first going to have to make sure that the horseshoe layer is selected. It is, but let's just pretend it's not. Um, so I'm down on the bottom layer. And let's say I want to select this horseshoe layer. Well, obviously, right now, I only have five layers, and it's actually called horseshoe. So I can just look and go find it and click on it. What if you have like 50 layers in your Photoshop file, and, or which is easier than you think? Um, how do you find it? Well, if you click on the, uh, on the image that you want to find, and you right click or control click, it gives you a list of layers that are, that are in that position. Um, and that can also be super helpful, just like navigating a file. Because um, if you have a Photoshop file with lots of layers, it can just, you know, I'm speaking as, a, as an artist, it can be kind of, kind of difficult <laughs> just to see everything. So OK. So now we're on the horseshoe layer. And basically what I want to do is I think I'm going to duplicate this layer. So. Um, from the Layers palette, you can click this menu icon. And this is basically just a list of everything you can do with a layer. So let's duplicate this. And maybe we can call it, oh, sure, I'm fine with the default in this case. And now I'm going to take that second layer and maybe put it over here. And then. I'm going to hit the Shift key and select more than one layer. Um, and then I can also right click. Um, it's just another way of bringing up the exact same uh, menu. Um, I can also right click and say, OK, duplicate layers. Da -da. And then we're a little bit closer to something. So basically, you know, you can make arrangements of shapes in this way. And certainly, we could make something a lot more interesting. Um, but for now, I just kind of want to get through some of these concepts. And we can see what we have time for. So now, you might be saying, OK, that's great. I have four separate layers that are like individual little things. And I can't really move the whole thing. But that's what I want to do, because it kind of Conceptually, it is a whole thing. It's like a, you know, it's four things together. So this sounds like a great opportunity to make a group of layers. And let me show you what a group does. So I'm going to shift click these layers. And then uh, I'm going to do new group from layers. Uh, don't panic. You can also just click new group and just drag them, drag them in. It's not like this is the only way to do it. 
So new group from layers is what I'm doing. And maybe we could call it horse shoes, plural, with an S. Um, and so you can see here, now we have horseshoes. A couple things have happened. So one is that we have a single bounding box um, around this object. So that means that any transforms that we apply to it um, are going to be sort of uh, applied to all four layers, right? Um, so that's one awesome thing. Um, the other awesome thing is that you can totally play around with these layers within the group. So let's say maybe I notice that this layer is slightly on top of this layer, on top of this layer, et cetera. You can change the stacking if you want to, the stacking order. You can still work on these layers completely individually as if they are uh, single layers. Um, so really what the group does is it, the grouping sort of organizes your layers palette, which is really key, um, because otherwise your layers palette just turns into a giant list of you know, things that you kind of can't really navigate through. Um, and the other thing is that it unifies, when you have the group selected, it unifies the, the layers into a single sort of transformation unit. So yeah, it's super great. Um, and then if you want to build up some complexity, we can actually duplicate the group. Do -do. And maybe let's, um, and so on and so forth. We could just make, you know, it's easy to generate 100 layers in under two minutes <laughs> um, if you're using groups and duplication. So, um, this is just one sort of way to kind of think about how to use design, uh, how to organize design elements in your, in your project. Does anyone have any questions before I sort of move on to the next thing? Yeah. How do you ungroup it? Good question. Um, so one way is that you can pop this out of the group by just kind of hovering up at the top and now you can see it's out of the group. Um, so that's how you would ungroup individual layers. Um, the other way is that you can, um, well, actually, if you delete the group, it will actually delete the group. So probably the best way is just to drag the layers out of the group. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Um, I think I'm going to close uh, horseshoe.tiff. Um, one thing that I do uh, when I'm kind of working on my own studio work is that uh, if I go through the process of, of making a layer mask and taking an image out of the background, I almost always save, save it that way. Um, why? Because I'm lazy and I like to go back and find work that I've already done and then use it in something else. <laughs> so, um, so if you're thinking about you know, making a lot of art or you know, making art for yourself, um, it's probably a good idea just to save these for your own creative purposes. Um, and in this case, this image came in as a TIFF, um, and that is a perfectly reasonable format to save. That will also save the layer mask. Um, we could also save it in a Photoshop document format. Not really a huge amount of difference. I know I addressed the difference between TIFF and Photoshop um, either last class or the class before. Um, basically, TIFF is sort of more, a little bit more interoperable, and Photoshop is a little less uh, interoperable. It's really only kind of usable in, in Adobe world. So um, go ahead and just save this before I get rid of it. Do -do. All right, so I'm going to find one more image in here look through my, I think these jellyfish look fun to me. So again, I'm just going to um, do the open with thing. Um, you might have seen I was sort of like hovering to drag this, and I guess we could do that, but it's, um, 
I personally prefer to open, open the files in Photoshop and then drag them in Photoshop like I just did, um, rather than doing this. And um, I don't, to be honest, I think that might just be my own personal preference. I don't think that there's really a huge reason why you would have to do that. Um, so we can use this layer and bring it over here. It doesn't really matter how you get the images into Photoshop. There's like many different ways you can do that. Um, what matters is what you do once you get them in here. So you may notice that also that now it looks like my layers palette is getting a little complicated and that's totally normal. Um, probably at this moment, I think it would be helpful to go ahead and give myself a little more space. So um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and pop out my layers palette um, and then I can sort of just get a better view of it and make it a little larger. Um, when I'm working in my studio at home, I actually, and, and my office here, I actually keep a big monitor, um, and I use my laptop for the palettes, and I use the big monitor for the work. Um, so if you're thinking about really getting into art and design, probably one of the single best things that you can do uh, for not a whole lot of money, like maybe $150, $200, is to get a 24 to 30 inch monitor um, because doing, uh, working with these kinds of apps on a laptop screen, it's doable and lots of people do it, but it's so much nicer <laughs> when you have the screen space. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and sorry. Um, I know I mentioned my eyes or I'm having trouble with my eyes. I'm kind of clicking in the wrong place a couple times. Okay, so now we're in there. And um, let's see. Okay, so we have this other image that we can kind of maybe do some things with. So one of the things that I wanted to show you uh, about this image was some other ways of making selections. So the magic wand tool is really great if you want to take a photographic image and make a really complicated selection, right? Uh, if it's not an organic shape or it's not a platonic shape like a circle or a square. Um, but don't, uh, don't underestimate the power of the square or the circle. Um, so there are these marquee tools in Photoshop the rectangular marquee tool and the elliptical marquee tool. Um, they're really great ways to think about uh, how to sort of make selections and even you know, make little design elements. Um, so we can just generate a couple of these in here. I was not holding the shift key that time. Um, so now you can see we have a few things selected and we could apply a layer mask to this. Um, in this case, I think I would like the, these to show as big circles. So um, probably uh, revealing the, the selection is actually what we want in this case. And now you can see I have a bunch of big circles. So I think one thing that I'm gonna do, I just went, moved it and went back a step, is that I think I'm gonna duplicate this layer. And I think this would be a good time to kind of jump into layer blending. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete not delete, oh my goodness, um, make invisible all of these layers. And right now we only have these two layers. It's this layer with the layer mask. So here I think um, I am actually gonna get rid of the layer mask on one of these uh, layers. So it's just kind of itself. So how do I get rid of the layer mask? Well, I can right click and say disable the layer mask. Um, that's how you would disable it without deleting it. You can also just delete it. 
Um, so because I have the same layer mask in another layer, I'm just gonna delete it because I don't need to really save a copy of it. Um, and now you might notice that these two layers are maybe not giving us the visual result that we would expect, right? Because one is just right on top of the other and they're exactly the same color, right? So if, so if I wanna make these, um, these dots sort of pop out of this experience, I have to do something else with this underneath layer. So let's do it. Um, I'm gonna change the layer blending mode of the underneath layer to luminosity. And now, did you notice how I said in the beginning of class that certain layer blending modes are sensitive to what's underneath them? So when we got rid of the background, I activated that layer blending mode, which is supposed to turn stuff black and white, by the way. And I was like, huh, no, not really. I just sort of realized that I forgot to you know, keep this layer on. So with the background layer on, we can start to really get into layer blending. Um, so I guess actually that might be a good case for having a background layer. But again, you could also just stick a white box behind it and still have the transparent background. So it's totally just an individual decision. Um, but the point is uh, that in order to make all of these wonderful layer blending modes work, um, you really need to have at least something underneath <laughs> the, the image. Um, whether it's black or white or gray or a color, it doesn't really matter. It just has to be something. Um, so yeah, now you can see we have these um, sort of dots or like areas of maybe selective color in this image. Um, and let's go ahead and turn on um, our other layers. Um, sorry, y'all, I'm uh, struggling a tiny bit with my eyes. I noticed I accidentally dropped these into the horseshoe copy layer, so let's move those out. And then I'll bring all this stuff back. So, okay, wow, it's, it's looking a little chaotic. Um, how are we gonna deal with that? Well, we can certainly sort of simplify. Um, one of the things that I love about Photoshop is its malleability. So you can do stuff and then you can decide, I don't like that, I don't wanna do that, I'm gonna get rid of it. Um, and so in this case, I think like the cats are cool, but maybe they need to be on top of the jellyfish. Oh, and maybe they need to be like sort of lined up here. That might make me feel a little bit better. Um, now I wanna um, sort of just scoosh this into shape, so I'm gonna hit the shift key so it can scale non-uniform. Am I super worried about like slightly warping fictional cats? Not really, um, not too worried about that. So, um, so yeah, so now we have this sort of like maybe a little bit more organized. Um, the horseshoes are sort of maybe not really doing what I would want them to do compositionally yet. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and activate both of them and select both of them and uh, see if maybe I can find a, a way that I can be a little bit more okay with them. So probably what this would have to be is maybe just me working on it a little while longer. I think I might actually, if I were to work on this as a real project, I would probably like to have more uh, horseshoes. Um, I think I'm gonna take some of them and take this one and put it up, maybe up here. So it's not the worst composition that I've ever seen, but it's also definitely not the most interesting. Um, I also think I will select all three of these layers and just drag this down a tiny bit. I don't want it dead in the center, um, but kind of dragging this down a little bit would be helpful. And so basically, at this point, I'm pretty much done. Um, 
I do want to mention before I get into sort of like wrapping up the project that these layer blending modes, there's like 25 of them and they're all um, really cool. So if you're looking for something to really explore when you're doing this project, like just scroll through them and see what they look like. You know, you kind of have to just preview them every time to see what they look like. Um, but that can be a really great way to add effects into your project. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to save it as a Photoshop document for my own purposes, my own individual purposes. So there's that. Yes. And then uh, for turning it in, I'm going to save as a copy a JPEG. Um, and when I make that JPEG, I want to set the compression to 12 for the least compressed possible. Um, the reason that we ask you all to submit JPEGs is because Canvas doesn't really have the oomph to accommodate 200 Photoshop files <laughs> that can sometimes be quite large. So um, in general, you know, using those JPEGs as like a tool for communication and then using the Photoshop files as kind of like your primary artwork is, is really what the practice is all about. Um, I have one other quick thing before we go, and that is that I prepared some variations of this, uh, these source images just to kind of show you um, different ways of approaching the idea of making two compositions possibly using the same source material. So I'm going to go ahead and open these. So yeah, here's one that I made. Same images, just different layer blending, different, different ways of arranging them. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, and then we also have this one is pretty distinct too. So um, again, just um, different, you know, different ways of arranging them and different ways of combining them and different ways of using the layer blending modes to kind of exploit maybe the color of certain images more than others. Um, those are all sort of like good strategies. So um, it looks like we're out of time. If you have any questions, obviously happy to talk with you now or later over email. Um, and yeah, hey everybody, have a good couple of days.